Hallelujah. Lord, you are worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy of our of our praise. You are worthy of our pain. You are worthy of our rising ups and our laying down. You are worthy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. In Jesus, Jesus, Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Go ahead and have a seat. Um, I want to kind of set something straight. Um, it's not really something that's crooked that needs to be straight. Understanding. So I was part of a church plant one time years ago, and there was a group of people who would come. And it was interesting because they would wait till the music part of the service was over, the worship through song, because all they were interested in was the preaching. And um, they would hate this place. <laughs> and I and I've thought to myself, you know, for somebody that maybe is visiting or or maybe really worship through song isn't a thing that engages them, there's a couple things I wanna I want to kind of help you understand is first of all, um, if you don't like worship or the worship that's okay because you're not the one being worshipped. Um, because the one being worshipped loves it. Um, the other thing is, you know, you can go onto YouTube and find many more preachers that are way better than Pastor Rick and myself and, and others that preach here. Way better. Um, None of them with as nice a hair that I have, but right, Cloud. And uh, that's right, Wendy. Encourage, be an encourager. But you are an encourager, and we bless that. Um, but the opportunity to spend time in His presence together—I don't think you understand what a gift that is. And when we, when we minister the word and the things that the Lord has put on our hearts, it's not that our goal is to be the greatest Bible teachers you've ever heard. It's to provoke you and to prod you to function together. And as we all function together as the body, many members with many purposes, but we can't fully realize that until we really entered into his presence until we've really been in his presence and we really experience his goodness. Because what I experience tonight is I experience and I begin to watch breakthrough happening in the lives of people. Um, you know, during the time of praying together and um, people were being healed. How many people were healed just by people in the body of Christ praying for you that had pain? And you know, I mean, there's four people right there, five people right there. Okay, so... Yeah. And so this isn't a healing service tonight. This isn't the pastor giving you a whole bunch of things about healing and then doing all the stuff that goes along with healing. These is members of the body of Christ who understand who they are, whose they are, and that it is our job to carry the kingdom. That's all we have to do carry the kingdom. Jesus said in Matthew 10, he says, and proclaim as you go, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In the very next verse, as the very next verse, verse 8, he says, he says, and when you're doing that, this is what you're going to do. You're going to heal the sick. You're going to cleanse the leper. You're going to cast out devils and you're going to raise the dead. 
And so that's an expectation of believers. That is an expectation that Jesus has placed on anybody who claims to be a believer in him, that those are the things you're going to do. You're going to go proclaim the kingdom, and you're going to do those things. So last week, Pastor Rick started this sermon series on revival. And he um, kind of gave you the, I was going to say the 30,000 foot view, but it may be even a little higher than that of what revival looks like and the things that spur revival on. And, you know, we, we, um, we look through history and we, we hear about different revivals that have happened in, in throughout history. And the same things happened in the Old Testament as happened since Pentecost. You understand that? The same system to bring revival to God's people. Now, it may look a little different because you have cultural things and things like this. He talked last week about Charles Finney and, and the Welsh revival. And, you know, there's stories of Charles Finney walking into public places and people saying, Mr. Finney, have mercy on us because the presence of God was so strong when he walked in the room that people literally felt pain that they would go to the ground. I remember he went, I read a story in his book, Lectures on Revival. It's, it's a wonderful read, about 1,200 pages. Um, you know, tells the story where he goes into his brother-in-law's factory, and that's what, exactly what happened. Business shut down. Business didn't shut down because the government said you can't be in business because of some virus. It shut down because of the presence of God filled the place. I think about the in, in, in China in the early uh, late 1800s and early 1900s in Changtung, there was a revival that happened. And the most memorable thing in this revival, um, signs and wonders and all kinds of amazing things. But what I read that caught me, caught my attention so deeply was there was a woman, and from what I gather, an elderly woman, would greet people as she, they would come and go to this gatherings. And she would say, are you born again? And if their answer was yes, her response would be, is the power of the Holy Spirit evident in your life? Because if the power of the Holy Spirit isn't evident in your life, let's go back to question number one. You're probably not born again. Because the two can't travel without each other. And so I want to look at a couple things. Um, we're, going, we're going to be focusing in on tonight the idea of pursuing holiness what that looks like because revival in a region in a nation cannot happen until the church on an individual level begins to pursue holiness to use a technical word it would be called personal polity right but if we don't pursue holiness, we will never experience the revival that the Lord wants to release. And so I was talking to a pastor friend of mine one time about this very subject. How many have ever read the book by Jerry Bridges, The Pursuit of Holiness? Okay, it is, it's a real thin book. And um, when you read it, I would encourage you to wear steel-toed shoes. It is wonderful. It's one of the best books I've ever read. And then if you really want to have fun, you could get it on CD. And Alistair Begg, the, scholar, the Scottish uh, Reformed pastor, actually reads it. And he reads it with the most beautiful Scottish accent. And so you're listening to Alistair Begg thinking about Jerry Bridges and their pursuit of holiness. And this pastor, we were talking about this book, and, and he did not like the book. This pastor friend of mine, he did not like it. He, he says, Pastor Lee, that's legalism to pursue holiness. Why would I pursue something that I already have? Because you understand when you come to Jesus, you're made new, right? The old man is dead. The new man is raised up and he's alive. And so the idea is now that I have the identity of Jesus, I am holy. I am righteous. I am blameless. Nothing that there is no condemnation. I'm in Christ. But then why would I pursue holiness if I already have it because I'm a new man? That's a good question, isn't it? So this year, I'll be married to my wife for 22 years. I have her. There's no question. We've never considered divorce. 
murder a handful of times, but never divorce. Um, but I have her. There's no question about it. She is mine, and I am hers, and we have each other. So what would you think if I stopped pursuing her? What would she think if I stopped pursuing her? Would she feel like I had her? Would I feel like I had her? Even after all these years, there's still a pursuit that has to take place. And so the same goes that throughout history, throughout post-Pentecost history and Old Testament history, one of the leading things that has to happen in order for revival to strike the church and to begin to transform regions is that we as people have to hunger and thirst for his righteousness. We have to pursue holiness. We have to. That is our part. He is holy, so we pursue him. And so Pastor Rick brought up a passage of scripture last week, and I'm going to kind of, I'm going to kind of piggyback on it for a moment. In 2 Kings chapter 23, the high priest said to Shaphan, the secretary, I have found a book of the law in the house of the Lord. Now think about this. This, this is the Torah, the first five books of the scriptures, the book of the law. This, this is what Jews would have, and they still today, they, they, this is the holy book. And so the high priest is telling the secretary, the scribe, I found this book of the law. Well, they were remodeling the temple, and they found this book. And Hilka gave the book to Shaphan, and, and he read it. And Shaphan, the secretary, came to the king and reported to the king, your servant has emptied the, out the money that was found in the house and delivered it into the hands of the workmen and, have, and, ha, and the oversight of the house of the Lord. Then Shaphan, the secretary, told the king, Hilkah, the priest, has given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. Now, here's what we have to understand. The king, this is Josiah, and the people of Israel, including the priest, had never read the book of the law. They never read it. Generations of people who have walked away from the law of God, and the scriptures say that the law is perfect for reviving the soul. Entire, an entire nation, an entire religious system that was based on this law hadn't read the law. They, had, they didn't even know what it was in it. So they were just doing their own thing. They were in the Near East, right, where all these religions of the world were gathered around them. And, and they would say, well, I'm a high priest of Yahweh, but they didn't even know Yahweh. They hadn't read his letter to them. And so they saw, they saw the Philistines, and they saw the Amorites, and the Hittites, and the Kuzites, and the, I don't know whoeverites, the termites. And they saw them worshiping false gods. And they just joined in. Because they had not let the law of the Lord penetrate their heart because they hadn't even read it. Isn't that amazing? That's amazing to me that the people of God, the chosen people of God, had strayed so far from the law of Moses that they didn't even know what was in it. And all of a sudden they discover it. And when the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. Now, what you have to understand about this is in this time, when somebody would tear their clothes, that was a sign of grieving, like, oh my God, what have we done? Right? This was this sign of grieving and, and remorse for the things that they had been doing. And the king commanded Hilkai, the priest, and Hakim, the son of Shaphan, and Akbar, the son of Machai, and, the Shaba, and Shaphan, the secretary, and Asiah, the king's servant, saying, Go inquire of the Lord for me and for the people and for all of Judah concerning the words of the book, this book that has been found. 
for great wrath, for there is great wrath that is kindled against us because our fathers had not obeyed the words of this book to according to all it's written that's concerning us. And so, so the king recognizes that something needs to happen. They recognize the Lord, but all of a sudden they find themselves separated from his holiness through not following his law. And the first thing he does is he sends his priest and he says, you need to go talk to the Lord. You need to go talk to the Lord. You have to remember something. The veil had not been torn. The system was to go through the priest. You need to go talk to the Lord. What is going on? We have found this book, and obviously our fathers never read it to us. And probably their fathers hadn't read it to them. We have no idea, and as I'm reading this book of the law, I'm realizing that we are so far away from what God has intended for us that, we, that great calamity awaits. This is what's happening. This is the thing that Josiah is realizing, right? And so as we skip down a little bit, this is what the Lord says. It says, thus says the Lord in verse 16, Behold, I will bring disaster upon this place and upon its inhabitants. All the words of the book that the king of Judah has read, because they have forsaken me and have made offerings to other gods, that they may provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore, my wrath will be kindled against this place, and it will not be quenched, but to the king of Judah. So this is the Lord now saying to the king of Judah, Josiah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord. Thus shall you say to him, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, regarding the words that you have heard. Because your heart is penitent, because your heart is full of grief, because your heart is repenting. You have humbled yourself before the Lord, and you have heard how I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants, that they should be, become a desolation and a curse. And you have torn your clothes and wept before me. I also have heard you, declares the Lord. Therefore, behold, I will gather you to your fathers, and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace. And your eyes shall not see the disaster that I will bring upon this place, that they, that they brought back the word to the king. So a couple things that I want us to consider. I skipped some of that for the sake of time. So the Lord is saying that basically he's saying, I am going to remove you understand the children of Israel, when they would experience calamity, when they would experience exile, when they would experience problems, it was rarely that the Lord actually was the one doing them. Typically, what he would say, you want it, Bubba? Hands off, go ahead. My protection is being lifted. And how can I say that? How can I say that that is the way that the Lord works. Well, it's very simple. In Malachi chapter 3, when there's this, there's this promise about when we give our tithes and offering, it says that if you tithe, that the Lord will withhold the devourer. He will hold him back. Right? But then if you go into Haggai chapter 1, it says it, there was a rebuke from the prophet Haggai, and he's telling people, he says, listen, you live in nice houses, but the Lord's house is in ruin." So here's what's going to happen. I'm going to stand back and let the devourer do his thing, and you're going to work, and you're never going to have enough money. You're going to eat, and you're never going to be satisfied. You're going to drink, and you're going to be thirsty. You're going to have money, you're going to put them in your pockets, and the pockets are going to have holes. So this is kind of how the Lord works. He says, you want what you want, I'm going to back up. But with Josiah, he says, I'm going, your, your household, because you have been penitent and you have, and you have torn your clothes and you are repenting and you are wanting the word of the Lord to go forth, you're going to be protected. And Josiah was able to bring revival to the entire nation of Israel through Judah. And so what we have to understand in this is ignorance for the 21st century church is not an excuse. It's not an excuse. 
These people kind of had an excuse because their fathers and their father's father and everybody else generationally left it behind. But if you're in the church today, all like I said before, all you have to do is turn on YouTube and you can get some of the most amazing teaching throughout the world. Some of the most amazing worship throughout the world. Ex- uh, ignorance is not an excuse. Here's the issue. Here's the foundational issue why the church isn't experiencing the type of revival that the nations experience is because individuals are too willing to hold on to their rights to what they want and what they think they deserve rather than to be penitent. We hold on to our rights, and typically our rights are the very thing that walk, keep us in walking in disobedience to God. So we, are, we say that we recognize that Jesus in us is holy, therefore that's enough. But he says, pursue the holiness of Jesus while you recognize you have it. It's kind of like this. Jesus is calling us from the future into the future. He's calling us from holiness into holiness. But if I want what I want more than what he wants, I'll never be able to step into the holiness of God. And and the simple fact is this. If you're hungry, you'll find food. If you're hungry for more of the Lord, you'll find him. He's not hiding. He's not hiding. And so, one of the reasons I believe that we as the American church are not seeing, and revival is coming. Now listen, I know this may sound a little bit like a rebuke, but I don't intend it to. I'm just wanting to highlight some of the reasons because in a few minutes, I'm going to give us an opportunity to deal with it. But one of the reasons is because Americans, and listen, I'm one of them, so we're rebellious. And our entire nation was built on rebellion. But guess what? Almost every other nation in the world, too. Because it's human nature. And you you read the Old Testament and you see it. Rebellion. Rebuke. Repentance. Right? And so, here's what I know. Or here's what I'm wondering, is as a people, are we willing to pay the price for revival? Are we willing? Are we willing to pay the personal price for personal revival in order to usher in corporate revival? Are we willing? See, see, there's these things that happen in our lives where we have blind spots. Where we have blind spots and over the Lord, you know, and it's easy to, because, you know, the Lord was angry with these people because they had erected idols to other gods. We've done the same thing. We've done the same thing. Our, our government is an idol. The things that our money buys is idols. The things that we do with our time are idols. We have all kinds of idols that we've erected before the Lord. And here's the thing that I find very interesting. And and this is a question that I want you to consider. When somebody who loves you challenges something that's going on in your life, do you defend it or do you receive what they're saying? Because if you defend something that somebody that you know loves you sees going on in your life, That says that you're unrepentant and not really pursuing the holiness of God that's in you. Okay, and I'm going to give you an example, and some of you may get mad at me. And at this point, I don't care. There is no such thing as Christian yoga. No, I'm going to say some things right now. There is no such thing as Christian yoga. If you're a Christian and you're doing yoga, you're literally inviting demons to wrap themselves around your spine and to have control over your mind. 
That is what happens in the Hindu religion. And I have talked to Christian after Christian after Christian that say, well, I listen to praise and worship music, but your life is a freaking mess. It's because you're doing these stupid stretches, inviting demons to live inside of you. But I'm a Christian and I listen to Christian music. So what? Years ago, I went to South America with a guy who now has a ministry called Christian Cannabis. I don't know what his problem is, but he's not a Christian. I sent him a message not long ago. I said, man, what's wrong with you? You've lost your mind. It was the most ama- he was the most amazing guy. 20 years ago, he started a ministry helping people come out of the porn industry. TripleXChurch.com. It was the most amazing thing. This guy, we were friends. And now he's lost his mind. And if you talk to him about it, the Bible says, be sober-minded. And he's saying, no, dude. That's what happens when you live in California. But the thing about it is this. If we defend the things that the Lord is saying, that is unholy. Do not invite it into your life. Do not invite it into your life. Stop Stop reading books that are full of witchcraft. Stop listening to music that is pour, pouring spells over your life. Because in 1 Peter, Peter writes, he says, be holy. Jesus is the one saying this. He says, be holy for I am holy. And you can't have salt water and spring water coming out of the, or fresh water coming out of the same well. It doesn't work. And you can love Jesus. You can love Jesus, but if you love yourself more, you will hold on to those things. This is why this is why when Peter was on the beach and Jesus was on the beach and Peter jumped out of the boat and he swam to him and G- Peter's Jesus is cooking breakfast and he says, "Do you love me more than these?" He's saying, "Do you love me more than the way of life you've ever known?" And he says to him, he says, Peter, do you agape me? Which was a word for love that never existed and Jesus introduced it into the language and it means, do you love above all things? The word never existed until Jesus spoke it. And Peter's response was, Jesus, you know I phileo you. You know I love you like a brother. Because he had not made a commitment. Now he later did. He later did. But Peter says it. He says it in chapter 1. He says, listen. Therefore, preparing your minds for what? Action. Be sober-minded. There you go, Craig Gross. Be sober-minded. Christian cannabis dude. Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. So think about this. Before Christ, you had things that were, man, you were passionate over. They were drawing you in to destroy you. And he says, don't be caught up in those former ignorant passions. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deed, conduct yourself with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were, listen, listen, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers. Doesn't that sound familiar to Josiah's story? You've been ransomed from their feudal ways. Not with perishable things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. See, the thing that we have to realize is you are called to be holy because he is holy. And you say, but it's my life. Well, according to this, you've been bought with the blood of Jesus, so your life is not your life. You've been bought with a price, and it's the blood of the creator of the universe. 
your life is not your life. And let's think about this for a second. In order to have revival, we have to... I need to back up before I get into that. You will always eat what you're hungry for. You will always eat what you're hungry for. Today, our friends Ramon and Monica were at our house, and we were laughing about some of the crazy experiences I've had in different places in Haiti and different things. And their their boys are 10 and 12 and 13. And when I mentioned that I encountered a zombie there one time, you know, their ears perked up and they wanted to hear all about it. And um, it's kind of a stupid story, quite frankly, but... But I was remembering one time in our conversation this. One time I was climbing this mountain to get to this remote village that the first time that I went there, I was, Pastor Rick and myself were the first two white people probably in a The children were so scared they took off running. Now the adults had seen white people because they had been down into the cities and there was UN and all kinds of things. But but children had never seen white people, the little ones, and they were scared. But where we would start our walk was about 3,000 feet above sea level. Now you have to realize it's 3,000 feet above sea level, but the heat and humidity is exactly what we have here. So the heat is what we have here. The humidity is what we have here, and the air is really thin. And this fat preacher almost died on that mountainside. And I'm walking up. This was the. But this particular time, I remember walking, and at one of the stops where we found a tree that we would stop and stand under, and you know, your heart is pe pumping peanut butter, you can barely breathe. And this guy walks past us he's got shiny shoes you know i'm ripping sweat and 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 just a total mess and this guy's got shiny shoes and iron pants and dressed to, to the hilt he's got this big chain on with a cross on it shaved head shiny as can be and i asked him i said where are you going first i said where are you from and he said that he was from the city down the mountain. So it's an hour drive to where you start to walk. And it's two hours from where you start to walk to where we were going. And I said, where are you going? And he says, I'm going to see somebody an hour past this village. So it was a solid three to four hour trip for this guy. And I said, who is that? And he said to me, it's a special voodoo priest. And that has stuck with me for many years because this guy lived far away, quite frankly. Significant price because he got up about four in the morning to get to the where he was going to start walking and went on this journey to meet with his demon doctor because he was hungry for whatever he thought that that guy had to offer him. But in the American church, we won't even get our butts off the couch to encounter the Lord. And we say we want revival. We want our nation to be changed. Do we? Do we? Mahid El Shafi says that the word, the world is divided into two zones, a conflict zone and a comfort zone. And in the comfort zone, the church is weak. Well, guess where we live? We may have big buildings with fancy programs, but the church is weak. But in the conflict zone, the church is strong. We've experienced that when we've gone into places where communism is there and they're opposed to, to the church. And the church is strong. And revival is happening. But one of the things that we have to realize is that we are responsible for our own 
pursuit of the holiness of God. We are the ones, you're responsible for yours, and I'm responsible for mine, and we together are responsible for one another. That's why Jesus says that you are the light of the world, a city on a hill. Individually, you are the light. Together, you are the city. And if the, the lights are dim, the city will be dim. We want revival that's going to change the city. We want revival that's going to change this region. We want revival that's going to change this nation. But will we pursue, will we pursue holiness at any cost? Will we pursue an encounter with the Lord at any cost? Those kind of encounters that change us. Now think about this. The holiest person to ever walk the earth. Jesus, I think you've heard of him. He had all authority from heaven and earth. But you know what he was entitled? One of the titles that he was given He was described as a friend of sinners. So Jesus was able to walk in absolute holiness, yet being a friend to sinners, which then gave him authority over the lifestyle of that sinner to bring transformation to the world. And that's where revival happens. But the thing is, is the church that is weak, who is more concerned about its own comfort and its own rights, had no power to be a friend of a sinner in order to lead them to transformation because you, you yourself look to the sinner just like them. When I say you, I'm not pointing a finger. I'm talking about the church. You know, and I've, I try not to look at Facebook that much, but it's interesting because through this season of, you know, we have this virus thing, we have this, this race thing, now the police thing. We have these people. Everybody is divided against somebody. And I look at people who are my friends on Facebook from all over the world, and you know what I realize is hearts are being exposed. Hearts are being exposed. And how can we expect revival? if our heart is determined by the world rather than our heart determining the world. Because I know this, I know this. Anything that I've ever wanted, like actually gotten. There's never been anything that I've actually would say to myself, I really want that that I haven't gotten. Now, there's things that I really want that I'm in the process of getting. But if you want to pursue holiness because you want holiness, you're going to get it. You're going to get up early and spend time before the Lord. And spend time with the Lord. When you're with your friends and they begin to become crass, you're not going to participate in it. You're going to find yourself surrounded by believers. You're going to do what Darlene does every Saturday night. She's here at 5 o'clock interceding for people. You're going to get here at 5 o'clock. Turn the boob tube off and get here early so you can pray. If you want that, if you want that kind of stuff in your life, you'll pay the price. But you don't understand, Pastor Lee. I went to the beach. The beach will be there tomorrow. And I'm not trying to be legalistic, but I'm asking the What do you want? Because if you want it, I guarantee you, you'll get it. And the truth of the matter is, is we want a comfortable life with lots of ease and the benefits of an American society, and we want to put a little Jesus on it like butter on toast. Because it, toast definitely tastes better with butter. And so, what do we want? Because I believe that there's this thing that's happening. And it's been prophesied over the Treasure Coast multiple times over the last 10 years that there's going to be this little light that's going to start to come up. 
And it was described as a little light. And it's going to come up, and what's going to happen is it's going to begin to catch the region on fire. And I believe, honestly, I believe that the Lord is waiting for this group of people to become hungry for Him more than everything else. And we're that little light. We're not interested in being a church with a lot of programs that's doing all these things, trying to get a name. All we want is to be the place where the little light shines and you grab a hold of the fire and you carry it into your job, into your lives. We're, we're, we're concerned about equipping you to be who Christ created you to be, a representative of him, to represent him to the world. That's why we have a discipleship school for supernatural ministry. It's not because we love supernatural ministry, which we do. But the idea is, you know, here's the thing. The people go to church in order to learn the character of God, and all they want to do is learn how to behave well. He was without sin, but he didn't behave well in the eyes of his culture. How can I be living in the image of Christ to represent him to the world if I'm not walking in his holiness and then doing the things that he did? How can I represent Christ if I'm just a good moral person? I need to be a good moral person who carries the power of heaven with me. And that doesn't happen if I'm choosing to live a life without his holiness manifest. And so here's what I want to do. Brandon, if you'll play that music. I'm going to ask you to stand up. I promise we're almost done. But that shouldn't really be too much concern. Close your eyes and set your affection upon the Lord. I want you to think about what he looked like on the mountain of transfiguration where his entire what a sight that must have been. And I want to ask you this. Do you want more? Now, I understand that we're a, we're a people who see signs and wonders, and that's not what I'm talking about. That's a byproduct. But do you want more of who he is? That thing that's inside of you. That that nature that's inside of you to be holy as he is holy. The beautiful thing is the Lord doesn't hold against us what we've done and say, you've done this and you've done that. Therefore, you will never be able to receive my holiness. He says, I have bought that. I've paid ransom for that. I have covered that with my blood. And from this point forward, I will make you holy so that you will change generations. I believe that in this room, there are people both young and old who have generational callings on their life. That you will be to shift generations. But do you want him and his holiness more than you want your rights to do what you want when you want? Do you?
So here's what I want to do. Just put your hands out in front of you as though the Lord is going to give you a gift. And so I'm about to pray for the grace of God to fill this place. And did you know that the, the word grace in the New Testament that means unmerited favor only appears like three or four times? But really, the, the word grace, every other time, it, it, has the, it has this word dunamis in the Greek attached to it, which means power. The Lord did not leave us to be orphans, and he did not leave us without power. And so what I'm going to do in just a second is I'm going to begin to pray for his grace. And it's already starting to fill the room. Some of you are hungry for more. Some of you aren't sure. And I'm going to pray. And I'm going to pray. If you want to come forward and get before the Lord, you're welcome to do that. If you want to get down on your knees or in your face right where you're at, you're welcome to do that. But some of you are going to begin to experience such the weight of God over you right now that you need to understand what he's saying is, I, am, I, have, I see you, I am pinpointing you, and it is time for you to be like Josiah and have a have grief in your heart over what your ancestors have left before you and, and to repent so that revival can flow through your life. More, Lord. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Release your grace. Release your grace in this, in this house tonight, Lord. We want more of you. More, Lord. We want more of you. We want, we want to realize and walk in your holiness. The Lord is saying that some are, some are seeing situations and, and they, desire, they desire a particular outcome. And it's going to require compromise. And the Lord says, don't compromise. Just stay steady and watch me deliver you. Jesus, come. Holy Spirit, come. Grace, come. I see him moving on many of you. More, Lord. Double it. Double it. Mas poder, Senhor. More, Lord. If you're experiencing something on you right now, you need to look, understand if you're experiencing some form of power or you're crying or energy or cold or hot, you need to understand that the grace of God is being poured upon you for a purpose tonight. Don't shake it off. Open your heart to him. Open your heart to him. There's some, there's some that are, are considering what we've talked about tonight and say, this is just another thing I have to do to perform to get my father's approval. And, and, if, and if you're considering that and you say, I have to start doing in order to be holy, he's saying, you are holy, now be holy. Because he is holy, you are holy, so be holy in his holiness. Mas poder. Some of you have significant love deficits. And you have to understand, anywhere we have a love deficit, we have a God deficit. 
Because God is love. Lord, release your love now. We want more of your love in this place. Your holy love, fill, fill more. More, Lord. The Lord is saying that he has given you strong feet to stand. That his people not lay down at society and at culture, but we stand in front of it. And we speak truth to it. Some of you are called to be truth speakers to the culture. To find yourself right in the middle of the culture and to speak truth to it. particularly the fatherless culture. To stand before the lie of our culture that says uh, it's okay to spread your seed wherever you want, take no responsibility for the fruit. We stand against that. And we declare today, and we decree that you are a good father and you have called us to be good fathers and mothers not just over our own children, but over your children. To help the helpless. Lord, we thank you, Father. Lord, we receive your grace. We receive your grace. So, this isn't terribly specific, but I think it's specific enough. Um, is anybody currently facing like a, a, a not a not a bill, but like a financial crisis between five and six thousand dollars? It's somewhere in that general area. That if it doesn't get met, you feel like you're going to be sunk. Is that anybody here? Yeah, it's around fifty six hundred and seventy five dollars something real close to that yeah so um, the Lord the Lord wants you to know that he sees you and that even if it doesn't get resolved the way you think that it's going to be resolved he's working um, I hear the word creativity um, and I sense that there's going to come a time in the near future where you're going to be awoke in the middle of the night. And he's going to point out something to you that's creative in nature that's going to help you resolve this issue. It's not money falling from heaven. You're going to have, a, you're going to have something you have to do as part of the process. Um, but he sees you and he does not want you to be jammed up with fear and uncertainty. Um, because $5,600 does not scare him. And it shouldn't scare you because he lives inside of you. Is your favorite color red? Or something like that, a red or a purple or something like that? Is it? Yeah. Um, Red, though, right? Is it more red than purple? Tell me yes or no, because I feel like I'm swinging and missing here. Yeah? Okay. So, um, it's like he, this thing that he's going to show you is, is a gift that you're going to wake up and you're going to see this gift and it's going to be wrapped in, a, in that color. But you have to unwrap it. 
His part is he's going to put it before you and he's going to do it in such a way that it's in that color. It's like a, it's a deep color. Though almost, I can't even describe it, but it's, um, it's going to be wrapped in your favorite color and you're going to have to unwrap it. His part is to put it before you. Your part is to unwrap it. So